when you hear an advertisement, for example, or anything from a marketer, promotion, whatever, you tend to be skeptical of it and say, oh, they're trying to get me to buy their product because they make money if I buy their product. And so we have a natural set of defenses uh, that we bring up, uh, persuasion defenses, if you will, that you know, sort of keep us from being persuaded too much by people who are trying to persuade us of things that we might not want to be persuaded of. And so that's the standard reaction to lots of advertising and marketing communications. When you ask people questions, you kind of come in under the radar of that defense system, if you will. And you start to ask someone, how much do you like this wine, for example? They start to think about, oh, how much do I like the wine? Not, you're trying to persuade me. Because they don't understand part of the psychology of answering that question. And part of the psychology of answering that question that we've uncovered is that people tend to not answer that question in the most unbiased and straightforward manner, which is, uh, you know, I like it a five out of 10. They try to ask themselves questions in a biased way. So for example, you said, you know, is this wine smooth? People wouldn't ask the question, well, just how smooth is it? And let me answer that. It's, they start to test the hypothesis, yeah, this wine is smooth. And they try to recruit evidence in a biased way where they're recruiting evidence for this being smooth and they're kind of ignoring evidence against this being smooth. And they tend to say, yeah, it's pretty smooth. And so if you ask them positive questions, like, is this smooth? Is this velvety? You know, is this delicious? They tend to say yes. If you asked, is this a rotten one? I imagine they would tend to say yes to that too, but you probably wouldn't want to ask that. And so when you ask these positive questions, people give you these biased responses, but they don't know they're giving a biased response. And so what you end up doing by asking these kind of positive questions, you get them to recruit evidence in their own head in a particular way that can move their impression of your product or service or what have you. And they don't know this is happening, and so they don't defend against it. And so you can find that asking questions is actually more persuasive than the standard claims that you might see, for example, in ads, because by coming in under the radar, you're not getting this normal defensive, re skeptical reaction to, to the marketing communication. And so we have a number of studies uh, that show a variety, of, you know, a variety of effects around this, including people like products more if you ask more positive questions. You could ask, is the wine smooth? And people would say, yeah, I guess it's pretty smooth, and that might be good. But you could go further and say, is this wine velvety? And use kind of a fancy version of smooth. And people say, oh, you know, and they'd start to think about it and start to recruit evidence for why it might be velvety. And at the end of that, they kind of think the wine's kind of velvety. And velvety is, you know, even better than smooth, and so they would like the wine even more. One of the interesting pieces of this, so perhaps the key piece in why people aren't aware of it and don't defend against it, is this biased information processing. There's a tradition in psychology going back 30, 40 years that says when we try to test ideas, we don't really test them in a fair way. We tend to have this called confirmation bias. And so this confirmation bias notion has been out in psychology for some time. And we don't know everywhere it's going to rear its head. But that seems to be at the core here is there's when I answer the question, how velvety is this wine, I'm more asking my question, can I think of reasons this wine is velvety? And I'm not asking myself with equal force the question, can I think of reasons this wine is not velvety? If I did that, these questions would have no effect. But because I don't do that, because my natural way of thinking about is this velvety, well, let me think about things that are velvety parts of the experience, let me think about this wine, let me sort of put those two together, and you get this, you know, this confirmatory bias that underlies it. Because that underlies it, and that's not part of our lay intuition of our own psychology, we don't know that we do this. Because we don't know that we do this, we don't, we're not able to, you know, to recognize, oh, this is a persuasion attempt, I need to use the usual defenses that I would use when a marketer claims something about their product to me. And so I think that's kind of the, the most uh, interesting piece of it for us. And I think it's the reason it works is people don't understand that, that they do this. I would argue that you can actually change the value of the experience for people. So you can get them to enjoy your wine more in every meaningful sense I can think of as a psychologist or as a marketing person. They like it more. They'll have a better memory of it. They'll recommend it more to their friends. They'll pay more for it. They'll be happier with the whole experience. They'll feel a better mood if you can get them, if you get them thinking in these kinds of ways. If you get them thinking about why the wine is more velvety and not you know, by asking these kinds of questions, you're actually changing the experience and you're changing the memory and you're really making the experience better. So I, you know, in thinking about the question of is this good for consumers, for example, I think there's a sense in which the answer is it makes the experience better. Now, overall, is that good? You know, that's a, a broader question that will depend on the context and the consumer. But I think this is a real part of changing the experience. It's not a superficial thing in the sense that for the moment they believe, okay, this is a little better, and then later it will go away. I think these effects uh, are likely to be lasting. 
uh, and I think therefore they're likely to have a real, you know, a real positive impact on consumers' experience, at least of that product, perhaps now and in the future. Behavioral economics is an interesting term, and uh, we could talk a long time about that. But I think one of the, my understanding of even the term behavioral economics is it's, you know, how does psychology apply to situations that were typically described in the past by economics? And so product evaluation is something that economists would, you know, put a, a simple utility function on and say, look, you know, this wine is this good. They'll like it this much. They'll pay this much for it. If it's better, they'll like it more. Psychologists come at that and say, wait a minute, how good is this wine is a very ambiguous question and how you ask it and what kinds of questions you use and what kinds of ads you have and what your brand is like. And all these things have a big effect on that. And so now you get into the behavioral part of, of consumer behavior or behavioral economics as it's often uh, called. And in that situation, what's most interesting is economists would presume that standard economics prior to behavioral economics would assume you have a certain value for a product or a service based on the attributes of that product or service. Behavioral economics says you have a certain value for a product or service based on how you might think about that product or service and the context in which you're thinking about that. And a marketer asking you questions may be a critical part of that context. And here it seems to be a critical part of that context because it brings some memories to the fore about how this wine had a velvety taste and pushes others to the rear, like how this wine might not be velvety. And so it, it's very much a behavioral economics idea of how the value of something changes based on the context or subtle cues or you know, things especially that are unknown to the consumer themselves that are affecting them. I think that's one of the hallmarks of a behavioral economics kind of effect.